In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So this season of Epiphany, which started uh, with the Sunday after Epiphany with Jesus' baptism uh, and the skies opening up and uh, God's voice saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, now comes to a close. Ash Wednesday will begin the season of Lent, and this is the last Sunday of Epiphany. And we always have the story of the transfiguration of that mountaintop moment. And it set itself up perfectly to talk about what a mountaintop experience it was for UVA to be number one in the country <laughs> for the first time since 1981. Uh, but that unmerciful school down Route 81 had other things to say. So, so then I had to go back to the drawing board. So one of uh, our rituals in our household uh, right at bedtime, uh, and pretty much all the rituals around bedtime are to prolong uh, the staying awake part. Um, but I go in and um, uh, less time than Anna spends, but I go in, I sort of ask, you know, how was your day? And um, you can guess which child responds which way. One child uh, has uh, an incredible range from okay to fine uh, to uh, when it's been an incredible day. Good. <laughs> The other uh, child uh, vacillates between uh, frenzied euphoria uh, and, and desolation. I mean, it's, it's uh, you can imagine which one. But, in a, uh, but uh, one of my uh, children uh, actually surprises me every now and then by asking me, Dad, how was your day? Uh, which also sort of puts me back on my heels. I'm not quite sure what to say, and I'm sort of thinking, and. Um, and I realize I must respond the same way almost every time uh, because uh, my daughter will say, so it was okay, but you didn't get everything done that you intended to get done? And I realize that's probably kind of how I answer the question every day. But I, I'd like all of our days to be a little bit different. I'd like our days to have more intentionality and to be strung together with a little more purpose than uh, either a response to the good and bad things that happened in the day or just fine, or uh, recounting the things that didn't get done. Sometimes we have to get away from those day-to-day -day things to be able to have that kind of perspective, to be able to put that kind of purpose or perspective into our days. We need to climb that mountain. You know, I was thinking about the collective mountain climbing that's taking place over this fortnight. Uh, we had our vestry retreat, and I came uh, home to uh, the uh, Olympic opening ceremony, uh, and what a mountaintop experience that is, and how much hope uh, is, is put into that, um, uh, that opening ceremony, or, or what this two weeks represents. Uh, you know, and some of it, you kind of can be one of, of one of two minds. You can either be a skeptic uh, and sort of question, uh, how much unity do we really have? What about all the questions and issues going on in the world? Are North Korea and South Korea really joined together, or is this just an opportunity? Uh, you know, uh, do we really live out of those symbols of those Olympic rings? Uh, is America as unified as that Olympic team seems to be? Uh, and we can be so skeptical that we lose that opportunity to see what happens on that mountaintop. Or we can say, you know what, maybe this is a glimpse of the way that we're supposed to come down from this mountain in two weeks after this fortnight is over uh, with renewed hope that maybe we can live into that reality. Uh, I think in life we need mountaintop experiences. I think they transform us and they give us perspective. In this mountaintop experience, there's a lot leading up to it. They are on their way to Jerusalem, and they have heard what's going to happen, but I don't think they've processed it. A little bit like us, we understand the, you know, uh, the anxieties that float around, but sometimes we just try to push them down. Uh, the stock market crashes. We, uh, our debt is, is seemingly out of control. Uh, there's uh, conflict and, and discord, and we push it down. Uh, either that or we're like a, 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 a pinball, and we just bounce around in it. Uh, but it's all around us. And with the disciples, they're heading to Jerusalem, and Jesus has told them, this is going to end on the cross. I am going to die. Uh, and they don't really believe it. Maybe they believe it, but they push it down. And so Jesus takes 
uh, three closest to him, those that are going to have to lead the church after he's gone. And he says, before we get to Jerusalem, we have to go. Um, and he takes them with him. And he takes them up the mountain. And from the top of the mountain, he gives them a perspective that what is about to happen uh, is not just uh, uh, about the Roman Empire. It's not just about uh, 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 the Jews that feel threatened. It's not just about this moment in history. This is about the fabric of God's relationship with God's people from the beginning. Uh, and it's about God being at the helm. And it's about Jesus being part of that sacred story that's still being told and still unfolding in our lives today. And for them to be able to step forward on the other side of the resurrection, to be transfigured people, they need to understand that moment. And so they climb the mountain together. Jesus takes them up the mountain, and they get up to the top of the mountain, uh, and it's something like nothing you've ever seen. Um, and you have to remember, back then, they didn't have great bleach, and certainly if you were uh, of a poorer class, uh, your robes look dingier than, 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 than my robes generally do. Um, and it was a sign of, uh, of prestige to have uh, white robes, uh, but to be able to have them dazzling whites like nothing you've ever seen, uh, it had to be something that sort of had them on their knees. Uh, they were terrified, it says. And it wasn't just that Jesus was there in this dazzling, uh, supernatural white. It was that he was there uh, with Elijah and Moses. Uh, I mean, these are the superheroes, the rock stars uh, of their tradition. And they're all there together. Uh, and they're trying to make sense of it, one. And two, they don't want to go down the hill. They don't want to go down the mountain. Because when they get to the bottom, they know where they're heading. And it's not going to be easy. And this is, this is special. This is set apart. And so they want to stay there. But Jesus says, no, we can't set up residence here. We can't live here uh, on the mountaintop. But let this experience inform the way you live when you get down to the bottom. Let it be the anchor that you have uh, that guides each one of your days, that gives your days purpose, that shines a light into your days. Jesus was transfigured on that mountain, but when they got to the bottom, the very first story is about them needing to be able to be the ones that heal, to do God's work. They need to be the ones transfigured. And it's hard. And I have to tell you, I actually got to go, when I was in Jerusalem a year ago, I got to go, it's almost two years now, uh, I got to go to Mount Hermon, where they believe the transfiguration uh, took place. Uh, but the way that we did it so that everybody could do it, and so it didn't take too long, and, uh, and uh, we drove up to about 100 yards short of the top. Uh, we parked uh, the bus, we got out, we walked up to the top, and we had Eucharist, and then we got back in the bus and we came down, and I realized uh, there was a whole lot missing. Sometimes in order for us to really get away from life, to really be able to climb the mountain, to have a different perspective so that we're transformed when we come down, uh, we really have to take all the steps. We really have to get all the way up the mountain and journey so that we can experience what it is to step away from this world so that we can walk back into it a little bit more transformed. As we get ready for Lent, I invite us to take those steps. And I think we have something to guide us. One of the most beautiful things when you sit down and you think about all the different things that inform uh, how we worship together, uh, it all points to that same truth, that what we do here is what's taking place in this gospel story. God comes outside those doors and says, come with me. Let's come up the mountain. And we walk up together. So that when we get to the very top, uh, our hands are outstretched and we receive a sign of resurrection, a sign of grace, a sign of hope. We receive the living bread and the flowing wine, Christ's body and blood. And we're transformed by it so that when we go down the mountain, we can leave the world transfigured. Lights shining in the world, dazzling white for the world to see. We prepare ourselves intentionally. We come in through the doors. We take time to pray. We hear and respond to God's word. We confess those things that we haven't done. We pray for the needs of the world. We reconcile with one another. We hear our sacred story. And each one of those steps is critical because when we get to the mountaintop, when we receive Christ's grace and Christ's glory, Christ's love, 
we're asked to walk down that mountain to be different in the world, that all our days might matter differently. So Lent's not just about us dropping that five pounds that we put on over the holidays or um, figuring out ways to uh, maybe do some self-improvement in our lives. It's figuring out how we can take that transfigured Lord that, uh, that, that we've witnessed, that incredible grace that we've received, and be light, and be transfigured in the world, be transformed to do God's work in the world, so that we can walk to the other side of the cross and live as resurrected people, people of light and life. That's why Jesus took those that would be the foundation of the church up that mountain, and each step mattered, and they couldn't stay. They were sent back down the mountain to be that light in the world, just as we are. Amen.